The stars in the Late Late Picture Show, A Touch of Love at 1.30. Pick of the Week is at 3.30, and at 4, follow in the wake of Captain Cook, Down Under. Sunday, through the night, on Anglia. Well, now on Anglia, we continue your Sunday night viewing with The South Bank Show, introduced by Melvin Bragg. Tonight, a film shot in Greece about a man considered to be the greatest travel writer we've ever had, Patrick Lee Fermor. Patrick Lee Fermer belongs to the English tradition of the splendidly gifted amateur. He's a scholar who never went to university, a soldier who turned war into a boy's own paper romp, a traveller without maps who, as an 18-year-old in 1933, walked across Europe from Rotterdam to Constantinople. Above all, he's a writer of famously rich and resonant prose, who's recorded his great journeys, Adventures of the Road and Adventures of the Mind, in a series of remarkable travel books, most notably In a Time of Gifts and Between the Woods and the Water, which recall his teenage wanderings across Europe, and Mani, a lyrical exploration of the remote corner of Greece where he now lives. Patrick Lee Fermer wandered into the desolate but beautiful country of the Mani on the southernmost tip of Greece more than 30 years ago and fell in love with it. Here with his wife Joan, he built his dream house to be the perfect retreat. It's both a fortress against the modern world and a celebration of everything Greek. From the halls of Plato and Aristotle to the Cretan shepherds who fought by his side in World War II. Well, I'd always wanted to come to Greece. I'd always been fascinated by it. I'd learnt Greek at school. And I think, like a lot of other people, I was first infected with a passion for Greece by being, having um, uh, Kingsley's Heroes read aloud to one when I was a child. And I think I'd never look back after that. You said that you ran wild in your childhood. What did you mean by that? I was a, a, a terrible handful by the time my mother and sister got back from India when I was uh, four and a half. And, um, and so I sent to all sorts of prep schools and so on. And, um, they did what they could with me, and I, they, even, they, they were so worried uh, uh, being such a nuisance that I went to see two very important psychiatrists one after the other, and I was sent to a very extraordinary school, a co-educational school, for a very short time. They, they did naked folk dancing at that school, uh, didn't yes, they? Uh, yes, they did. Yes, they did indeed. <laughs> yes, and, and all sorts of country dances, you know. Uh, old moles, villagers around, gathering peas, peas cods, picking up sticks and that kind of thing. And um, all stark naked. <laughs> and. Uh, Finally, funny enough, it was the only, only place that was really sacked from me instead of me being sacked from it. My mother found that there was something rather fishy about the school, and I think she was rather, rather thanks to her that the place um, came to an end. I'd had a very stormy school days. I always seemed to get the sack from everywhere, not for anything very terrible, but being very unruly and very undisciplined. So I was uh, sent to an army crammer. And the idea of becoming a, uh, a regular soldier and a city of the Sandhurst exam. But I'd still, I was age 16, so I'd still got a, uh, two years to go before, go before going to Sandhurst. And so I spent two very rackety years in London at the age of 17 and 18 and having a lovely time. I did a certain amount of work and I, uh, I passed the qualifying exam. And then I suddenly thought, well, I seem to made a hash of everything else. And, um, I think the only thing to do is for me to go, sort of go abroad, wander about and see if I can find some sort of solution myself. 
And so I set off on the 8th of December, 19, uh, 1933, and um, landed at uh, the Hook of Holland, and uh, uh, went on to Rotterdam, and then set off along the Dyke Road, and I was away, and really never looked back. And it was a very important moment in my life. The siren of a barge unloosed a long echo, and the road, scanned by brief halts, brought me into Bingham at dusk. The only customer, I unslung my rucksack in a little gusthof. Standing on chairs, the innkeeper's pretty daughters who were aged from five to 15, were helping their father decorate a Christmas tree, hanging witch balls, looping tinsel, fixing candles to the branches, and crowning the tip with a wonderful star. They asked me to help, and when it was almost done, their father, a tall, thoughtful-looking man, uncorked a slim bottle from the Rudersheim vineyard just over the water. We drank it together, and had nearly finished a second bottle, by the time the last touches to the tree were complete. Then the family assembled round it and sang. Next morning, the household embraced each other, shook hands again, and wished everyone a happy Christmas. The smallest of the daughters gave me a tangerine and a packet of cigarettes wrapped beautifully in tinsel and silver paper. I wished I'd had something to hand her neatly done up in holly pattern ribbon. I thought later of my aluminium pencil case containing a new Venus or a royal sovereign pencil, wound in tissue paper, but too late. The time of gifts. I borrowed a rucksack off a friend of mine and I put in far too much. It's a big, heavy sleeping bag, one of the silliest things I'd take with me. And um, I took far too many clothes and um, lots of writing materials. Um, but the whole lot, I got lost the whole lot in, in Munich. Um, the whole lot was pinched. And it really was a, rather a blessing. And I went to stay at some very nice white Russians just outside Munich that I got a letter of introduction to. And. Um, when I told them about this, which I rather, rather rashly did, that I, the night before I lo lost everything, I turned into a sort of joke. They took it frightfully seriously, dashed up to the attic, dug out, um, uh, dug out a new rucksack, an old rucksack, and filled it with everything that I could possibly need. But it was much lighter than before, and so it was a great blessing, this lies. Except the only thing was uh, that I had lost, lost my diary, which, which I'd kept from um, the Hook of Holland to Munich. One of the things that strikes me about your work, just one of them, is the extraordinary detail. I mean, people don't pull out a handkerchief, they pull out a clean blue handkerchief. The shade is described, the direction it comes from, the slats of the sun. The detail is uh, very, very convincing um, and very particular all the time. Does this come from notes that you made at the time or from recollection? I have got a very strong visual memory. I, think, I mean, I do largely it seems to live, live through my eyes, as it were. Uh, observing things and um, and the, the the memories do remain pretty clear and intact on the whole. Malik, a fine chestnut with a flowing mane and tail, one white sock, a blaze and more than a touch of Arab to his brow, was waiting by a clump of acacias on the Segled Road. My friends set off for Pest and I for Constantinople. I soon came to a cottage. As the other side of the house was noisy with mooing, a woman who was spinning there shouted through the windows and in a minute a granddaughter brought a foaming glass of milk. They both smiled as they watched me drink it. I sipped it slowly and thought, I'm drinking this glass of milk on a chestnut horse on the great Hungarian plain. Twenty years passed before Lee Fomor wrote any of it down and when he did he was embraced by a famous name in publishing. What I first thought of him um, he was a character I've never quite ever seen the like before. Uh, there was a marvellous ebullience um, after the first glass of claret. 
he was even more ebullient. And he could quote almost anything he wanted to know. I mean, Shakespeare, he could quote in several languages. And his width of knowledge, which in view of the fact that he'd been sacked from his private school, was perhaps extraordinary. Uh, and I often thought that if he lay sleepless at me in bed at night, what an enormously wide world he would have to wander in. How did you cope with basic things like the language or the languages? Well, I had to, I had to learn a bit. And soon, um, in Cologne, uh, uh, in Cologne, I bought a copy of um, a copy of Hamlet in German. Hamlet, Prince von Denmark, translated by Schlegel and Tieck, uh, brilliantly translated. And uh, that's really what I what I learned German from was talking to people. Well, well, every pub I went into, wherever, wherever I stayed, I naturally had to talk. None of them speak in English. And reading them, um, and reading passages I knew from Hamlet out loud in German as I sort of trudged along over, 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 over the snow. Do you still have it, the Hamlet in German? I mean, can you still? Yes, I can, more or less. Chunks of it. Could you give us a bit of a chunk now? Sure. Sein oder nicht sein, das ist hier die Frage. Ob sie den Gemüt die Pfeil und Schleudern des wütenden Geschicks erdulden oder sich waffnen gegen eine See von Plagen durchs Widerstand zu enden. Sterben, schlafen, nicht weiter und zu wissen in einem Schlaf, dass Herz und die tausend Stöße endet, das uns das Fleisch ist Es ist ein Ziel, als innigste zu wünschen. Sterben, schlafen, schlafen, vielleicht auch träumen. Ja, da liegt was in den Schlaf für Träume kommen mögen, wenn wir den Drang, der sie uns schon abgeschüttelt, das zwingt zum Still zu stehen. It was 1933, and the Nazis had come to power and once surrounded by evidence, by swastikas everywhere, um, by this extraordinary uh, uh, political system, and um, which, was, which was, of course, absolutely fascinating and very repellent. And uh, I had endless arguments about it in, um, in, um, in pubs, as a rule. And they were always interested to hear what English people got to say about it. And I'd, uh, I'd attack it always on the same grounds as um, uh, Jewish persecution, uh, um, the, um, the beginning of concentration camps, which hadn't been open for long, but they did exist and people knew about them, uh, and uh, about burning books. And they hated this. And um, uh, uh, they hated this. But they also had a certain, a certain kind of uh, a very strong respect for England, and at the same time, laced with a sort of scorn. They thought we were rather, I think they thought that we were rather uh, degenerate, hopeless, and, um, and there's a great wave of pacifism and, uh, and uh, various political beliefs uh, abroad in England at the time, which they thought were all militated to their benefit. And things like the, uh, the Oxford vote uh, never come up made to fight for king and country. They took very seriously indeed. It's cropped up again and again. And I was very upset by this. And um, I had to assure them that it wasn't through lack of spirit that we were, the English were very pacific, rather anti-military in peacetime. But um, I think I put it as Shakespeare put it. You know, that when the blast of war blows in our ears, we may take the action of the tiger, stiffen the sinew and summon up the blood, and this guy's fair nature with hard favored rage. They don't like that. Lee Fillmore's walk through Germany took him from beer hall festivity to lonely roads and days of solitude. I love being on my own. I've very much enjoyed company too. But um, I, I loved, uh, I loved um, uh, changing with you and getting, suddenly getting away from everything and being on my own. And I was quite happy walking for days and days in woods and forests or across plains. And I'd spend most of the time then um, uh, either si singing, I was sort of very, very fond of songs, and I was, uh, already knew lots. And I sort of picked up an, any number on the way, in various, <laughs> various languages. And I was of course singing them. And when I wasn't doing this, I was reciting, and quite often reciting out loud. 
which gave, it gave people rather a turn. It was suddenly turned a turn the corner. And um, you, of course, one thought they thought I was a madman. I, I ran into an old woman with a bundle of sticks once, and she simply dropped them with a terrific tapper, took to her heels. I wished I was dead. Now his path took him through the Balkans and south towards Turkey and journey's end. I determined uh, when I set out to go to Constantinople and then to go to Greece and find out both about Byzantium and uh, about ancient Greece as much as I could. I had a very extraordinary period. I borrowed a horse again and accompanied a, a, a Greek revolution uh, through Thrace and Macedonia uh, for, for a, a week or two. Uh, somebody lent me a horse and uh, I t t attached myself to, um, uh, to a Greek cavalry squadron and uh, went all over the place with no political feelings whatever, sort of observer. It was the first glimpse of warfare. And it wasn't, thank heavens, it wasn't a very bloodthirsty or serious one. And um, after that, I get, handed the horse in again. And this is in the Kalkidiki Peninsula, just east of Salonika. And from there, I, there I set off uh, into the pin, so towards the Pindus Mountains, and then down the central spine of Greece, until finally I got to Athens. And uh, I got to Athens in May 19, 1935. And there, a whole new life began. I made a lot of enormous amount of Greek friends. I got very sentimentally involved with somebody, in fact. And this romantic involvement took me um, to, to Romania uh, that winter. And I was off and on in Romania a lot until the war broke out. In immer neuen Wellen schaffen die Maschinen Kompanie nach Kompanie der Fallschirmjäger heran. The German invasion of the Balkans had swept southwards. With the Greek mainland overrun, Allied forces rallied on Crete, but were driven towards the sea by the power of the German advance. Lee Fermor, who had been assigned to intelligence because of his fluent Greek, was caught up in the retreat from the very beginning. And then I said, all through the retreat with the British Army, and then finally, I got away from Greece in a caique. And the idea was to pick up stragglers going down the Peloponnese. And a marvellous uh, captain from Sparta, a great friend of mine, Michali Mistos. And we were sunk at Leonidion, off the, coast of, off the east coast of um, the Peloponnese. We went on on foot, and then we bought another, an, another, caique, another caique. And we, bit by bit, made our way to Crete. And we, got, uh, we, we, uh, we changed uh, ships three times, but quite a lot of us, about a hundred, got to Crete. And, um, and then I was in there during the, during the Battle of Crete, and where they again surprised, the Cretans again, the Greeks again surprised one by fighting farewell. And all the civilian po population leaping to arms. And, um, and I was, as I was one of the few officers knocking about who, who could um, speak Greek, I was const constantly mixed up with them and the other officers who, um, who had anything to do with guerrillas. And I was very, very sad when we had, when we had to, to um, retreat from the island. And um, then I again went to every possible length to get back to Crete, which in the end, end I did. I'd been in Crete a few months and I was due for some leave. And he came and took over my area from me. And I had no idea who he was at all, uh, because we never used our own names. I'd heard that a certain Captain Michali was coming in. And we eventually met in this rather marvelous cleft right up high up in the, in the White Mountains. And it was about nightfall when he arrived. Well, we had very much in, in common. We'd uh, had the same kind of education, classical education. We both were Greek. Uh, we both, I suppose, had, uh, had a rather, uh, what Matt Paddy would call a moss-repellent youth. We had been, he'd, he'd done this famous uh, walk to Constantinople. Uh, 
I'd done a much lesser thing. I was bumming around the Mediterranean for about a year before the war. And we were both rather young at the time and, and thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. Well, I mean, one of the great things of this war was the luck and honor I had of getting to know the Cretans. And the people were simple, yes, but uh, with enormous sense of humor, sense of honor, the most glorious, best people I've ever met in my life. We lived well, entirely looked after by the, looked after by the Cretans, you know, who, uh, who protected us and um, hid us in cave, uh, caves and uh, shepherd's huts. And very occasionally in their houses, it was very, very dangerous, you know, because uh, their German raids were very frequent and very severe. And, um, and the penalties, of course, hiding, um, hiding a, a British wandering, uh, a wandering British soldier would have been calamitous. The Cretans who fought with Lee Fermor were remarkably brave and resourceful, none more so than George Psikundakis, the shepherd who was to become a lifelong friend and fellow author. He was a very remarkable boy. He was a, a very poor shepherd's son. And he had, a, he had a, a, a few dozen sheep and goats, and, uh, which were all stolen. And uh, so he had nothing at all, and he became a great guide to the British mission there, and he sort of saved hundreds of lives, along with a lot of other Cretans, by guiding our straggling soldiers, Australians, New, Zealand, New Zealanders and British, to the south coast, where they were evacuated by submarine or motor torpedo boat. And he's an extraordinarily gifted boy. After the war, when I went back, he produced half a dozen exercise books tied together with string and said, I tried to put down all I could remember of the occupation and the times we all had together. And they were published, um, uh, published under the name of the Cretan Runner. We lived entirely up in the woods and um, in, the, in the caves with shepherds and goat herds. And, um, and we, we always had friends in the villages below, and when there was a, a German raid impending, there'd always be some uh, old girl down in the village who'd rush out and put a, put a coloured blanket on a threshing floor, which we'd be able to see from below, it'd be a danger signal. And so we'd do a bunk and um, go move along the flank of the mountains and shift into a different cave. But the, the landscape played, played, a, was, played an absolute tyrannical role on all our activities. We walked thousands of miles, I suppose, over these terrific mountain ranges. The Germans had pushed the Allied forces into the sea, and Crete had fallen. It was an occupied island. But at night, the guerrillas emerged from their caves to fight another war, and to launch an audacious counterattack. Lee Fermor and friends, in stolen German uniforms, kidnapped a German general and became the stuff of movie legend. Cut the wire, strike the dogs, kill the sentries. All possible. But you'll never get him away alive. We're going to bring him back alive to Cairo. What inspired you to kidnap Kripa? What was the, uh, what was the idea behind that kidnap? It's to strike a blow, strike a blow against, the, against the Germans. Um, without shedding a, a drop of German blood is the plan. Unfortunately, one, there, there was the, um, the, the driver, the general driver was a casualty. But otherwise, not a drop of German blood was shed. It was all done by stealth and planning and speed. Is he to get out, Wagen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. Come on! But we had a very bad luck in the end. We couldn't get away quickly from the southern, the southern point of Crete. We meant to. There was a huge hue and cry, and suddenly it filled up with Germans, not because of us, but because of some arms that had been landed there several months before. It was a real stroke of bad luck. And so we had to turn, turn off. Uh, westward, through the mountains, all with the party that captured the captured the general, and with the general himself, until finally we could find a beach 
free, uh, uh, face free of Germans and, um, and get a wireless message through to Cairo. And finally we did, after three weeks, we were met and got the, uh, and, uh, got the general on board and away to Mirza Matruz. About three days after, uh, uh, after we'd captured him, right up at the top of Mount Ida in a, in a cave, we both discovered that we got, we got um, uh, that we got the same passion for classical literature, and that was a great bond between us. One morning we were looking across the Amari Valley, and there was the top of Mount Ida, covered with snow, and he murmured uh, to himself uh, the beginning of the ninth third in the first book of Horace, Vide sut alta spet nive candidum soracte. See Soracte's mighty peak is white with snow. And by a stri marvellous stroke of luck, it's one of the very few poems of Horace that I know by heart. So I was able to go on. Neciam sustenant onos, suve laborantes, gelucque flumina constiterint acuto. And he looked very surprised, and his blue eyes gazed at me. And then he said, Ach so, Herr Major. And I said, Ja, Herr General. And we realized that we'd both of us drunk at the same fountains years ago, and then all of a sudden it seemed as if the war had come to an end, and things were very different between us after that. And of course, the, the German reaction to, it, to any guerrilla operation, or any sabotage, was extremely fierce. And burnt villages, executed villages, um, general, general catastrophe. And, of course, uh, uh, some months after the capture, the capture of General Piper, when the Germans were about to retreat, they mentioned the capture of General Piper as one of the reasons for destroying and killing a number of village, uh, villagers on their retreat. Now, it's the opinion of quite a lot of Cretans that these villages would have been destroyed with the, with the German, German general being captured or not. And, of course, they exploited this in order to try and set, the, uh, set the, the Cretans and the English against each other, but they totally failed. Yes, sir. Here it is, Mr. Yes, yes, yes. Here, Hannah. Look at that. Here, Hannah. 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 And a great deal of singing, and a great deal of very making, and a great deal of very serious conversation too, and deep and lasting friendship. Yeah, here, here. Sauce, ragu, based on an authentic family recipe for 50 years. Ragu. It brings out the Italian in you. An ITT Nokia. Great picture. The digital digivision. It, can it link with satellite technology? It can. Ooh. And has it that a picture within picture video thingy? Like this. Yeah. Oh. Great sound. Stereo? 30 watts peak. The business. So that's why you bought no. one of these. No. I bought it because it's a good looking box. Oh, yeah. ITT Nokia. The future is looking good. As with many things in this life, grace and beauty on the surface often belie the activity beneath.
1989 Vauxhall Senator, engineered for unruffed. like IBM, Wimpy, Sainsbury's, Pilkington, Ferranti International and ICI are committed to employment training. So let's train the workers without jobs to do the jobs without workers. For details, phone 0800-24-6000. For comfort from your cold, take Lemsip. The air in Greece isn't merely a negative void between solids. The sea itself, the houses and rocks and trees on which it presses like a jelly mold, are embedded in it. It is alive and positive and volatile, and one is as aware of its contact as if it could have pierced hearts scrawled on it with diamond rings or be grasped in handfuls, tapped for electricity, bottled, used for blasting, set fire to, sliced into sparkling cubes and rhomboids with a pair of shears, swum in, be set with rungs and climbed like a rope ladder, or have saints assumed through it in flaming chariots. It's no wonder that the Greek word for wind Animos should have produced the Latin word anima for soul. That pneuma and spiritus should mean spirit and breath and wind in both languages. When we were trying to persuade him to finish um, his latest book, Between the Woods and the Water, Nicholas Gika, Gika, um, that great Greek artist and his wife were going out to stay with them. And I said, oh, look, do do what you don't divert, Paddy, more than you can help to please uh, see he gets on with his book. And they said, oh, yes, yes, no, don't you worry. And when the Geekers came back to London, they said, you know, you needn't worry. It's all going marvellously well. You know, Paddy gets up at six o'clock, just before dawn, and he paces up and down the terrace, thinking out suitable sentences for the book. And I said, oh, isn't that marvellous? And it was only later, on one of my later visits there, that I discovered what he'd been doing. He was making himself a mosaic on the terrace, indicating with the Greek these names, letters, all the winds, the direction of the winds, and the angle that the sun threw shadows. Now that's the center, and that's B for Boreas. Under those oleanders. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Boreas, Anatoly, northeast. Anatoly, east. Uh, Noto, uh, Anatoly, southeast. And then delta for deuces, thesis there, and then back to um, uh, northwest and back to north. There we are, and that's the centre of the compass. That's been terrific. So we're, fun, we're, we're strolling across a <laughs> valley, a kind of. Um, He's a perfectionist, and uh, it shows, in a way, um, his corrections and variants. In that sense, do you find him an arduous author to work with, rather than a difficult one. Well, you know, the curious thing is that what some authors might do to one is an arduous bore. Some, you can undertake the most appalling duties, and yet it would be a delight. And it's a very curious fact. But perhaps this happens in all life, I mean. If you like or love the person you're slaving for, it's no slavery. But when you're sitting up there in your study or at the at table there looking out yeah. over the sea and, and writing, do you, do you think yourself back to the location? Do you do, do you do something akin to the Wordsworthian idea of recollection in tranquility? Yes, sort of. 
But I'll tell you what it reminds me uh, of more. It's like if you see a very dusty mosaic, where you scarcely in one of the temples, or the Byzantine temple, or ancient Greek temples, knocking about in, in Greece. Um, if you come across a mosaic, you can't see what, quite what's going on, whether it's the rape of Europa or leader and the swan. Uh, you try to make it out, and then you get a bucket of water, and then you start uh, pouring water on it, and bit by bit, the pattern emerges, and you see, uh, and you, and you see what's happening. And if it is some great historical or mytholo mythological event, anyway, something out of the past. And it seems to me that um, uh, thinking hard about a particular uh, part of one's past is comparable to this pouring pour, pour sloshing water onto a, onto a mosaic until those things clear. You know, overwrite much too much. And I, I think even, even the end product sometimes is a bit too fruity and can do a bit more cutting. You know, but I really, I really do go over it a great deal. And I'm nev never at all con content with the, with the results. I always feel like I should have done better. You load the sentences very richly. Uh, you like uh, lists, uh, uh, fresh words, um, recondite vocabularies, uh, Latinate constructions of sentences and so on. Um, that's your style. Uh, do you feel that you're particularly influenced in this by any one or two writers, or is it something that it's evolved and it's yours and that's that? I think the, the Latinate construction of sentences, I think it probably does come down directly from having to slog away at, uh, at Latin so much at school, Latin prose and so on. It's, um, one had to do so much of them, which I always loved anyway. But on the whole, I try to uh, try to keep the balance between Latin and Saxon uh, tilted, tilted towards the Saxon side. It seems to me that if you go uh, ballooning away with enormous great Ciceronian rotundities, the whole the sense seems to float away, float away and evaporate somehow, and has to be pegged down with the um, short Anglo-Saxon words of one syllable. Crete smoulders on sea, halfway to Africa, solitary phoenix of the Aegean brood. Songs, shouts, echo in a lunar wilderness where blood flowers on the knuckles of the mountains. High in the ilex woods, the black riflemen stalk, waking the din of bells, their jangling shots uncoil interminable echoes. Here, the hands of friends grasp yours forever. He has a marvelous rhythm to his writing. And he's always, he's always taught me, he says, and do remember, there are three things about writing. Uh, brevity, clarity, and euphony. And he's particularly good on the, on the last. Does it matter to you very much that you're in a particular place when you're writing? Well, I know I'm not much good at um, writing in towns. I've tried once or twice, but I find it impossible to stay, to stay indoors at night and not go out to dinner and have fun and sit up late and that sort of thing. Which, um, so I force myself to be in the country and I've uh, written in all sorts of strange places, a lot in Italy. Borrowed people's castles and that sort of thing, because they're countless people in, in Italy have got half a dozen castles they never use. It's quite easy to borrow one. <laughs> and um, and, and we've stayed with friends in Spain. And then I went and stayed a long time in a, in a, in a Benedictine Abbey in Normandy, saint andre near the Seine, where there were delightful monks with great friends, and, um, and I did an awful lot of work there. You've known, a lot of, you've known a lot of solitude. What intrigues me about monasteries is the fact that a community of people come together to keep silent. That paradox, almost. The Benedictines, um, they aren't entirely silent. No. Uh, the, the abbot of saint andre a man called um, uh, Don Gabriel Gontard, a very remarkable, splendid old prelate. Um, I, I talked to him about this, about, um, uh, about the prevalence of silence in monasteries, and he said, um, uh, Oui, hors de nos murs, on fait un grand abus de la parole. And I think, uh, I thought a lot about this, about the, uh, about the abuse of speech outside monastery walls, which he was referring to. And um, 
it seemed to me that the Benedictines had got it absolutely right. There was a, uh, at certain times of the day, you, you, you talked as freely as you liked, and whenever, whenever it was necessary. And it seemed to me that they'd got the balance absolutely right. Deep in Nefermo's beloved Marni country, there are perfectly preserved relics of the great Byzantine culture. It's the period he loves most, that point in history where East and West meet on equal terms. This church is called St. Nicholas Campinari, and it's built on one of the, one of the buttresses of the Tegesus Mountains, runs steeply up to the skyline, just beyond the church. And um, St. Nicholas was one of the most important saints of Orthodoxy. Uh, the church was built in the, in the 10th century. Um, when a church has no windows in it at all, it's a sure sign that it was the 10th century or earlier. But then uh, it was restored and decorated by Nicholas Spanis and his wife Maria in um, the middle of the 14th century, in the 1330s. And that's the church which we see all around us. The painter, this church, the main painter, wasn't at all a rustic painter. He's a very sophisticated fellow, very much of the um, school of, of Mistra, which, which was uh, thriving about three mountain ranges away to the north at the moment, which is one of the great, glo great glories of the Greek Orthodox world, as we all know. And then there are other incidents from, from history, Last Supper, Jacob's Ladder, the baptism there, and then, which leads us where the high altar is. And here, by the same very sophisticated, very sophisticated and powerful uh, uh, painter of this Mistra school, we see Christ in majesty. Uh, Christ Pantocrator, the all-powerful one, is written beside his throne. There he sits with his Bible in his hand, uh, gazing out into eternity. On his first journey to the Marni, Lee Fermat travelled to the southernmost tip by sea in a boat called a Kaik. These are the, the last peaks of the Tegetus Mountains, which start, start right in the middle of, of the southern Peloponnese and come leapfrogging all the way down the spine of the Marni. And these are the last few jumps of it until we get to a very narrow waste which we'll be passing soon before coming to the final cape. These last peaks that I was talking about, they used to be known locally, but less so now, as either the bad mountains or the, the mountains of evil council or the mountains of the three-pronged cauldrons. Kakuvulia is what it's called in Greek, which can be expounded either as bad mountains ill will, or people who wear upside down cauldrons sticking with three prongs sticking up, which they used to wear as helmets, when the piratical inhabitants here would, um, scimitar in hand, would board vessels in a predatory manner and, and take everybody prisoner, and then sink it. And here are all these villages, all of them, with towers that used to be much higher, which are getting lower every year. I was first, first attracted to the Marni because it, it was one of the places that, that had always managed to remain free of the Ottoman yoke during the Turkey, years of Turkish subjection, and also because no foreigners ever came here. It was considered the wildest, the wildest and remotest, in a way, one of the most uncivilized parts of Greece, where they had a very very wild kind of uh, semi-feudal life. I first came to this old town of Vasya, which is now a ruin all around us. Thirty years ago, Joan, my wife, we slogged our way up on foot from Porto Cayo, just the other side of the, just the other side of the isthmus over there. And on the way up, we met a girl carrying a, a, a carrying a lamb over her shoulder, and um, and she said, "Where were we from?" And we said, "Where were we from?" And she said, well, you're strangers then. And he said, yes. He said, well, you'd better come and stay, in my stay with my father's tower. 
It's the tallest tower, tower in that town over there, of um, Vathya. And so we did, we stayed there a week. And um, there it is. It's ruined now. The family's entirely dispersed. And, um, and we, they're, they're one absolutely delightful family. And we had great banquets on top of the, uh, on top of the tower, which is now completely toppled off. It's lost two stories. Unrecognizable. And a, a table, an iron top table, will be hauled up at the rope from the bottom. And, um, and after that, uh, a lamb, a, a roast lamb, which I hope we hadn't met before. And uh, there, we, there we sat feasting and drinking, and even singing in the sun, under, uh, singing in the moonlight, under a brilliant full, uh, full moon. No sounds at all, except a nightingale or two, and a lot of frogs croaking. I remember it very well. It's, um, it's a very extraordinary village. It stands in a sort of cone, uh, getting on towards the tip of the deep mine. It's only, only a few miles on here to, to Cape Metapan and Tenerus. And um, the inhabitants largely, largely lived by piracy. They were a very bold, lawless, freedom-loving lot of people, constantly engaged, like all these, uh, uh, all these deep mine-yard villages, in internecine feuds, which turned into civil wars. I mean, these towers be, uh, would be built in order to overtop each other. And sometimes you find them lying about in the street. They even haul enormous great um, uh, naval cannons to the top of them and blaze away at each other at about 10 yards distance. And the one thing that made the Marniot's guns all of a sudden, instead of pointing every direction at each other, all point in the same direction, was a Turkish threat. Should the Turkish fleet flee to the Kapudan Pasha, or the Grand Vizier suddenly loom to the south? They'd all, they'd, uh, there'd be a general truce, and they'd all leap to arms. There are two famous battles in which the women played a decisive role because it was re uh, reaping time by sitting about, uh, sitting about the, the Turks with their sickles and scythes and driving them helter-skelter, or so local le legend says, which I firmly believe. This is the journey that Lee Fermor recaptured in his book, Marnie, which some critics believe is his finest work. Here the Marnie is little more than a mile across. The mountains sink to a saddle, the concave coasts lace it into a wasp waist, then it rises and swells again for a last rocky league or two, and the coasts fall nearly sheer. A few minutes further south, in the center of another little bay, a dark cave yawned over the water. Panayote cut down the speed of the kayak. There it is, he said, the entrance to Hades. I dived in and made for the cave, which yawned like the lopsided upper jaw of a whale, the lower jaw being submerged, about 30 feet above the sea. The ceiling closed in to about a foot and a half overhead, as I could touch it now with my hand. The air was dark, but under the surface, the water gleamed a magical luminous blue, and it was possible to stir up shining beacons of phosphorescent bubbles with a single stroke or a kick. The submarine light from the distant cave mouth makes an intruder seem when he plunges phosphorus plumed into the cold depths to be swimming through the heart of a colossal sapphire. The summit of the peninsula sank steadily as we followed our southward course. At last, the trim lighthouse of Matapan appeared and the rocks fell steeply to the cape. At the very moment we reached it, the engine spluttered and seemed on the point of extinction. But the kayak sailed slowly past, and leaning over the edge, it was possible to touch the last sharp edge of rock where it met the water.
and some I hate being classified as travel writing. That people travel writers, travel writers do. <laughs> I don't know why, but I, and I, I hate being um, uh, labelled a travel writer because I like people uh, think of myself as a, as a writer. I suppose confronted by various things and writing about them. You know, either sitting down or travelling about. You know, I, I hate the idea of travelling, uh, travelling for writing's sake. If what I mean. You wrote the book, The Marnie, about, uh, about 30 years ago. Uh, and since that time, you've built this house, uh, stone by stone, uh, and literally dug yourself in to this place and to this district. How has it changed over that time? Well, it's changed mostly because, uh, because of the um, explosion of tourism, really. Um, when, uh, when, when I first came here, I mean, a lot of people had never seen a foreigner in their li lives before. I remember a, a, a small a small girl being lifted up to the window of the bus that we were both in, and the, and the, and the child's mother saying, "Do forgive me, so, uh, but my child's never seen a foreigner before, and nor have I." <laughs> and and and, um, and I said, "I'm awfully sorry," and slipped off. We're in an extraordinary place because behind us the Aegean and the Ionian seas meet, uh, and history has stormed across these uh, hills century after century. It's one of the reasons you like it, because it fulfills your historical imagination and because it makes vivid to you a great deal of the things that you uh, enjoy thinking about and discovering. I'd always had a passion for history. And, uh, I, and I, uh, history and the ancient world, uh, Latin and Greek. Uh, I, Greek, I'm not, ne I'm not nearly as good as I should have been because of, because of um, uh, my education was untimely cut off. And, um, but otherwise, I, I was quite, considered quite good at it, as far as I got. But I always loved history. Anything to do with, uh, with history, religion, folklore, uh, uh, famous characters, different countries, tribal movements, invasions, and always very pictorially. And I always, uh, I'm, I'm no good at remembering dates in a kind of tabulated form, but if I can remember what people looked like, if they're wearing, what kind of mitre a bishop was wearing, or whether a person was wearing um, a rough, or, or, or a lot of lace tumbling down, down, down the front of his coat, or a breastplate, or a coat of arms, I never place him once in about 50 years. It's a very visual memory, and it's very useful. We got hold of um, this bit of uh, uh, this bit of land here which was then complete, completely wild and uh, a wild olive grove with um, nothing but asphodels and one or two tortoises clacking about and um, and we got hold of it and, uh, for almost nothing because it was uh, quite soon after the war and built the house and here has been ever since and it's been very propitious for writing we both did it together and neither of us knew, knew an awful lot about architecture, but we got books about it, Vitruvius and Palladio and that sort of thing, mugged them up, and we both, both of us um, lived in tents here, so not a single stone was put in place without one of us being here. Where did the patterning come from? What's yeah, well, the patterning came uh, from... Uh, these were taken from, uh, from uh, the excavations of Olynthus in the Chalcidice Peninsula. And um, with uh, patterns of interlocking vine, uh, vine shoots and that sort of thing, and cables, and uh, different coloured pebbles, and um, and the rest of them we worked out with giant compasses. One felt well like the creator of the world wielding a huge <laughs> pair of compasses like this, like the picture by Blake, yeah. and yeah. Um, and God had, with his big, big, exactly. Yeah. And um, and we had a lovely time doing that. So here, in the house he designed himself to a classical blueprint. Feeding on memory, Paddy Lee Fermo works painstakingly on his latest volume of autobiography. Do you think you've written a book that you'd really like to write? Well, I've enjoyed writing them all. I find terrible sweat, very, very hard work. But I love it. But, uh, uh, but no, I, um, I've, I've, there's no book I'm absolutely pleased with. Can you imagine writing a book that you'll be pleased with? Oh, yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a dreamy moment. <laughs>